I'm very honored to be here and I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak about kidney stones. Um, I've entitled the talk, Rocks in Wrong Places, Humanity is Coping with Urinary Stone Disease. My wife helped me out with that. She's a lot more clever than I am. Um, kind of reminds me of that old Garth Brooks song, Friends in Low Places. You know? <laughs> if you have a friend with a kidney stone, they will be in a low place. Uh, I promise you that. And you've probably experienced that. Um, I'll shift through the talk. Um, I'll probably kind of flip through fairly quickly. If you have a pressing question, something that you think might add to the talk or the conversation, please feel free to raise your hand, but there will be a, a dedicated time at the end, as you know, for some questions. So I look forward to that. So without any further ado, oh, and uh, no disclosures for me. The only thing I got paid to do this was chicken salad chip, which was, <laughs> which was great. All right. All right. Does anybody know this little um, icon up in the corner there, the little blue square with the cloud man in it? I'll give you a hint, it's Waze, it's the Waze app. Yes, excellent, you win. So this is the roadmap for this talk. This little buddy's gonna help guide us through. It'll help you know how close we are to the end so that when you get really bored, at least you'll have a little hope that we're almost done. So we'll go through a brief history of kidney stones, um, treatment of them, just historical figures who have had kidney stones and the evolution of our technology. Why stones hurt? I thought that I would, uh -uh, it's kind of off and on there. Let me see, probably that connection right there. Okay, I'll try not to shake the podium too much. Uh, why stones hurt? It, uh, it didn't occur to me to put this in until I was making the talk, but I mean, I have women come in and say they'd rather give birth naturally to all five of their babies again than pass one more kidney stone. And it's fascinating to me, why are we wired that way? What is going on with our body? So we'll hit that briefly. Who gets urinary stones and why? How can they be prevented? What are the most common types of stones, and then how are they best treated? And some of the talk's kind of redundant, but uh, for learning. So going through some history, uh, stones are probably about as old as, as mankind, but um, given that uh, recorded history is, is not that old, really the oldest example of a stone we have is about a 5,000-year-old stone that was found in a sarcophagus in Egypt. Um, one of the pharaohs had one. I don't know what the pharaoh's name was, but that, that was in 1901 that was discovered. Um, so it, it, stones don't discriminate. They, uh, they are across the spectrum, young and old, rich and poor, uh, wherever you live, uh, stones have been found. Interestingly, in India, back in the 8th century BC, there was a, a famous uh, and well-renowned surgeon named Sushruta, and here's all sorts of things that Sushruta did. They said he was kind of the first plastic surgeon um, he uh, developed a, a technique to try to get stones out of people's bladders um, and was um, maybe infamous for, for doing those kinds of things. Bladder stones were the first kind of stones that garnered attention and therapy because the bladder is a lot more accessible than the kidneys. So a lot of the history kind of is more of a bladder stone talk than a kidney stone talk. Here is a picture of Hippocrates, um, the great Hippocrates, uh, whom most of you have probably heard of. He was in the fourth century BC. He was the great physician, the Hippocratic Oath that all the med students take upon their graduation and uh, through med school uh, was written by Hippocrates. Um, he, uh, he mentioned stones specifically in the Hippocratic Oath and it's quoted here. Um, I took the oath that 
I will not use the knife, not even on sufferers from stone, but will withdraw in favor of such men are as engaged in this work. So I guess I am now such a man as, as engaged in the work. But um, from, from long ago, this type of issue uh, has been recognized as, as a bad one. And uh, even the great Hippocrates is like, I'm not touching it. We need to go to people who are specialized in it. Uh, here is a picture of Jan de Doet. He was a lithotomist from the Netherlands um, years and years ago, 18th century. He is holding a stone that he took out of his own bladder. He did surgery on himself. <laughs> These surgeries were done between the legs. That area is called the perineum. They used to cut down there, go up through under the bladder, incise the bladder, get the stone out. Um, very, very uh, scary stuff, but he's proud of himself. Um, yeah, Jan de Doot. Here's another slide speaking to that history of lithotomists, these traveling surgeons that would go around um, trying to help people. The first picture is uh, kind of a, a side view of the male anatomy and they're kind of pulling things up, going through kind of under the scrotal area in that perineal area, making a cut and going into the bladder from below. They go right through the prostate. 24% uh, of people who had this attempted on them died afterwards. I mean, lots of, lots of blood, lots of infection, lots of pain. And some of the tools are there to the side. They look more like the torture instruments than surgical instruments. And, and they were highly regarded as that. <clears throat> starting to creep forward a little bit in the, you know, um, humanity here or the <laughs> civility of it. Uh, Jean Civial was a French surgeon. This is his picture up in the top right corner. On February 4th, 1824, he performed the first ever, not just urologic minimally invasive surgery, but the first ever minimally invasive surgery uh, when he operated through a man's urethra instead of making that horrible cut down through the bottom area. And so in this day and age of robotic surgery and laparoscopic surgery and minimally invasive, it's still a buzzword even in 2019. Dr. John Sivial was the first minimally invasive surgeon. This is his kit. This is the very kit that he used and developed. And these are um, a collection of sounds and scopes that really let him do um, in, a, in a visual manner, go through and find the stone in the bladder, crush it and extract it instead of making that cut. And so mortality dropped from 24% to 2.4%. So it dropped a whole order of magnitude with this development. Um, there was a lot of debate. You, I could have a whole hour talk just on like what this guy went through and how he fought with other surgeons of his day to get notoriety for it. It's fascinating. Um, but uh, I'll, for the sake of time, I will, I will continue on. Noteworthy there at the bottom, general anesthesia was not a thing until about 1846. So. Uh, just FYI, all these things were just, you know, take a shot of something and, and put a block in your teeth and grin and bear it. How did he find the stone in the bladder? So, by feel, or? by feel and some of these instruments, the long metal instruments, they're called sounds. And the reason they're called sounds is because they would go through the urethra and they would enter the bladder and if there was a stone there, they would clink the stone. You would actually kind of palpate and even auscultate uh, the sound of the metal hitting the stone. So, and lots of pressure in the suprapubic area, pushing down, feeling the sound. They didn't have CAT scans back then. Yeah. All right, so then just a quick slide. From 1850 to 1900, many different surgeries were performed to address kidney stone disease. This is when they started to first try to get at kidney stones and ureteral stones, those stones that exist above the level of the bladder. Lots of names here. You know, the first nephrectomy happened during this time period. The first open renal collecting system surgery for stone, which is where they would cut the patient open on the side, go into the collecting system, extract the stone, sew the system up, and get on with life. Big surgery, first happened in 1879. Um, anatrophic nephrolithotomy, big jump to 1967. That's when a stone is so big, it fills the entire kidney up. It's called a staghorn stone. It's because it looks like the antlers on a deer, like a stag. And they would bisect the kidney, open it up, pull the stone out and put it all back together. Amazing stuff, amazing advancements, scary advancements, but this is how we have come to where we are today. The bottom two, Young and McKay, first ureteroscopy in 1969, and then Marshall, the first flexible ureteroscopy in 1964. Those two, uh, that should be 74, those two guys, that's really the beginning of the modern era of our ability to with a very small, relatively gentle scope, go into the bladder, go up the urine channel to the kidney, and get to these stones and treat them. 
more, much more about that later, but we've only been doing this since about 1970. It's amazing how far we've come. Thousands and thousands of years to get to one point, and then it's just been real quick, almost like a, what's that book by Malcolm Gladwell, the, the, um, the Turning Point, or the, uh, I'll remember it later, but it's something like The Turning Point, like where that domino finally fell. So here are some pictures, you know, modern stone surgery, like I said, since about the 70s. This is a rigid ureteroscope up in the top right. Um, just a, a very fine little metal tube with some high quality optics through that that let us do work. A flexible version is down below it for stones higher up. Here are some good pictures of, uh, of the baskets that have been developed over the years. These baskets go through the scopes. They'll help us grab little pieces of stone manually extract pieces so that people don't have to pass them later on. The goal, our, always our goal when we treat kidney stones is to get someone stone free. We don't want to leave anything left over. Here's a great picture I thought of just trying to put the anatomy and the technology together. You have a flexible ureteroscope down bottom coming up through the urethra into the bladder, into that tiny little hole in the bladder called the ureteral orifice, up the ureter and the stone is stuck right in the ureter putting pressure on the kidney, causing a great deal of pain. Um, that, that urologist has gone up, it's, he's encountered the stone. Usually a laser would be used to break it up and then you can see that basket around the stone and, and the goal is to pull that out. Here's some intraoperative pictures I think are really great examples. First off, we've got an uh, x-ray called a retrograde pilogram where dye has been shot up the ureter towards the kidney and you can see the faint outline of the stone there. And with the, with the classic arrow sign pointing to it. We don't always have that. Uh, and then intraoperatively, when the flexible scope goes in that tiny channel, this is, I got too excited and I made the thing. <laughs> I just love what I would do. Um, this is the view inside that tiny ureter channel, not any bigger than, you know, the cord of my microphone. And that's our view. We get an excellent view. We get a high definition view. And the stones in there, that tiny little blue fiber in box D, that is the laser fiber. Not much larger than a human hair with pulsing laser energy through that. The stone is fractured and then a basket is used to extract. And then you see F, the final box there, he, the patient is stone free. Down below the ABC series of pictures, this is in the bladder. Okay, so we have not gone into that ureter channel yet. But in the bladder, sometimes a stone will get caught up right where that ureter enters the bladder. It's almost like the body is trying to birth that stone into the bladder. And you can see just the strain and the obstruction. There's no urine getting through here. The kidney's suffering, the patient's suffering. So we can just make a little incision there with the laser. The stone comes out and, and box, uh, or box C there is, is the end result. A nice open channel, it's gonna heal up fine. No more stone and the patient feels better. So, so much possible now under such great vision coming from the guy in India who used to just kind of do whatever, you know, <laughs> to the lithotomist, killing people. Now it's same day surgery and um, you're down a few days after, but you're home and, and mortality is, you know, less than 0.1% on these cases. Kind of the granddaddy of them all, stone surgery in my opinion, is called the PCNL, which stands for percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Um, if a stone is too big to pass, would be way too big to go up and use a tiny little laser on. Maybe one of those staghorn st stones that uh, staghorn stones that I mentioned before. We can go through the back on someone with a tiny little needle, put a wire down, extend that track, and then put a scope in, like you see here. Th actually, through the back, through the kidney. Sounds a little bit wild, right? The kidney is an important organ. Why would we stab a hole in the kidney? But it can be safely done. And uh, the instruments we use through here are so good, they can take huge stones that would take four, five, six separate surgeries with the laser and be done with them within an hour in the OR. So uh, this is actually the surgery that made me want to become a urologist when I saw this done the first time. The multiple steps to it, the, the gaining access, the wire passage, creation of the tract, going in with the scope, finding the stone, treating the stone, and then putting the tube in to help the patient heal at the end. It was just fascinating to me. Who here has heard of the shockwave therapy? I see some hands, yep. This is also arguably one of the largest, most significant technical developments in the treatment of urinary stones. This thing is like magic. Uh, it uses invisible but powerful shockwaves focused through the body and 
centered on the stone, wherever it is. And those shock waves converge upon the stone. They crack it. Um, they turn it into very, very small pieces that are then easily passed out the ureter naturally. Nothing has to be inserted into the patient um, other than sometimes we'll put a stent in to help out. Has anyone in here ever had a stent before? Yeah, ugh, sorry, it's, it's a bad word. Uh, it's a five letter word, not a four letter word, but almost. Um, so that's the only thing we sometimes would have to do for, for these stones. It started as a military technology. This is the very first lithotripter up at the top made by a company called Dornier, which is a military uh, industrial type company. They first had these shockwaves designed for use in wartime, but then they figured they could appropriate it for uh, medical uses. And so that was the first one there, introduced in 1980, approved in 84. And then a much more modern, modern version is down below, much quieter and much easier on the patient. We still do a lot of this. This is a great way to do it, especially for smaller stones that, that uh, you know, it, that would break up easily and so that you can avoid putting a scope up there if you don't have to. Here's another picture of it. The patient lays on the table. Everything's aimed. Use x-rays to just target everything and set it all up. And then the bottom picture shows how those sound waves, just acoustic waves, just focus right on that stone. I still, every time I see a stone breaking up on x-ray, um, I'm just kind of uh, fascinated by how magical that is. That before my eyes, things are happening and I'm not even doing anything. I'm just sitting there watching it. So here's a little slide on what a ureteral stent is. For those of you who have not experienced it personally, um, a ureteral stent is a tiny little piece of plastic. It looks like a plastic spaghetti noodle. And we will use these things to go up and bypass a stone that may be blocking infection and keeping infection in the kidney, which is a very dangerous state to be in. Um, people uh, get very sick and, and often can can die if they have a kidney infection that's blocked by a stone. So we use it to decompress that. We also will use a stent in the ureter channel. If we feel like our laser has irritated that channel, if we feel like our scopes have maybe partially damaged the channel, created swelling, because after a kidney stone surgery, even if we get the stone completely removed, the body has a way of, of really swelling up those fine, delicate tissues. And, and that, that swelling can block the kidney off just as much as the stone blocked it off. So for comfort, for healing, to prevent scar tissue, we, we use these stents very commonly. A lot of people get nauseous when they hear about the stents because the stent is indwelling, it rubs on the bladder, it causes a lot of frequency and urgency and discomfort. There's gonna be blood in the urine as long as you have the stent. It's really maybe the best example of, of a necessary evil uh, because it's just uncomfortable for so many people, but it really, it serves a good purpose. There's an x-ray up at the top. That's kind of how we see them. They're, Easily seen on the x-ray. Um, yeah. So switching gears a little bit. That's kind of the history and now current state of technology. Why do stones hurt? Well, the simple answer is it blocks the kidney up and the kidney doesn't like it. And the kidney has a lot of nerves in it connected to the brain. and That's why they hurt. Um, but that blockage uh, is a little more complex and delicate. And sometimes you can have kidney stones causing pain that don't present in the common fashion. There doesn't appear to be any kidney swelling, but there are stones in the kidney. There are symptoms the patient reports uh, that, that traditionally have been thought of as, no, that's not causing pain, but we have some new data to show you can have kidney pain even if there's no swelling. So there are three phases of what we call renal colic. You know when a baby is colicky, right? That's kind of an intestinal thing. The pain comes and goes. The baby gets up at night, he cries, he or she cries. Colic is a general term, but renal colic is a specific term we use in urology to describe stone pain. So if you ever hear someone talking about renal colic, talking about kidney blockage and stone pain. Um, one of my uh, mentors, um, I did undergraduate work at University of Virginia, and I met Dr. E. Derricott Vaughn. He, is a urologist, was a urologist who uh, trained and worked up at UVA, fantastic guy, did a lot of research in what happens to a kidney when you block it off. So conveniently, one of my, my old buddies is, is helping me with this talk. Um, he, he described three phases. And so if, if you completely block a kidney, just tie a knot in it, put a stone in it, acutely, just out of the blue, block it off. The first stage is you get a progressive rise in blood flow to that kidney and the kidney is trying to create more urine to overcome whatever that blockage is. Okay, so step one, progressive rise in the blood flow that the inflow valve opens up, more blood flow goes in. 
that can last about one to one and a half hours. And pain starts to build during that time because the pressure is starting to build. Step two is with the inflow of blood wide open and more blood flow going in, the kidney also has a little uh, portion of the vessel that can close down. That's called the efferent arteriole. So you open the water spigot, you close the end of the hose, and you're creating even more pressure, right? It's not just a lot of water flowing through the hose. Now you've actually closed the hose off. Pressure is building even more. And again, the kidney is trying to create this pressure to overcome whatever the blockage is. So that's, this can last for up to five hours. I mean, the kidney is going to just turn up the pressure for up to five hours. And that's really when folks are, yes, yeah, suffering. I see some faces out there who have been through this, obviously. Stage three, all the vessels start tightening. This is kind of when the kidney says, enough's enough. We've got to take a break. I'm going to kill my poor master if I keep doing this. Uh, and urine production begins to fall, and the pressure within the kidney begins to fall. So three stages described, beautiful graphs, beautiful research, very elegant, done by Dr. Vaughn. And uh, makes sense for a lot of you and, and, and explains why we get this kind of coming and going uh, of pain with kidney stones. All right, so two down, a few more to go. Ways is guiding us through. So who gets stones? All right, the, the term here is epidemiology, which means the study of the incidence and the distribution of a problem. So who gets them? Kidney stones have demonstrated a very linear progression um, over the past few decades. They are increasing. In 1976, your lifetime, the general person's lifetime chance of getting a stone was 3%. That went up to 5% in 1994 and 9% in 2010. The incidence of stones peaks in the fourth to sixth decade of life. Everyone gets them, but we, we do see them mostly in the fourth to sixth decade of life. Historically, adult men have had more stones, but women are catching up now for various reasons, and the gender gap is definitely closing. White men and women have the highest incidence. Black men and Asian women have the lowest uh, incidence and prevalence. Uh, and the prevalence of stones among children, and specifically adolescents, has dramatically increased over the past 25 years. And we think this is due to a childhood obesity ep epidemic, metabolic factors that change when uh, children are overweight. A big explanation, a big reason why some people get stones and others do not is genetics. What is not explained by genetics these days, right? Every time you pick up the paper or, or get on the internet or whatever, there's a new gene discovered for a new problem. And, and this is hopeful in one sense, because maybe we can target those things and find cures. But it's also like, wow, how can I keep up with all this and a bit overwhelming. But certainly some genes have been identified um, in, in, in study and in research that tell us a lot about why people get certain types of stones. So I have a picture here. This is the double helix. This is what DNA looks like on a chemical structural lever, level. It's amazing. It's got this backbone and it has these nucleotides. There's only four nucleotides, but the combination of those things, they just determine everything in life. And, and the thing that really is determined most by DNA is protein structure. Proteins. G DNA is translated in a complex process into proteins. Amino acids come together under the influence of DNA and RNA. And they, once those amino acid molecules come together, they fold up into these amazingly functional proteins. And so in the kidney, there is a structure called the nephron. Has anyone heard of the nephron before? Nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. It's a tiny tubule. It's actually a picture of it way on the far right. A tiny little tubule that communicates with a vessel. It goes all up and down the kidney. All sorts of chemical interactions and exchanges occur within that tubule. And that is how urine is formed. So within the tubule, there are these transmembrane proteins, the green and yellow and purple proteins. Some of them bring uh, substances into a cell. That's called symport, two at the same time, into. Some of them are exchangers, one substance out, one substance in, antiport molecules. And then other ones just take care of one, one molecule at a time, one element at a time. Those are called uniport molecules. But these, these protein plugs exist in cell walls, and the nephron would be nothing without them. I mean, they are responsible for how we concentrate our urine, for how we excrete toxins in our urine, how electrolytes like magnesium and calcium and sodium get into our urine and out of our urine. And uh, it all comes from DNA. So I, I th thought I'd just make that link. So we talked about nephrons contain these specific proteins which allow elements, atoms, and compounds, molecules into and out of the urine. I like, I put a few pictures of the nephron up here just so you can kind of grasp it. This is a nice picture of the kidney. 
a little cross section taken out and blown up. And there's the nephron. The yellow tube is, is where the urine is made. Blood vessels are just all around that in a very uh, intricate way. And there's exchange going on the whole way. The end product in the collecting duct there, the yellow tube going down on the far right, is where the urine is. And up until the moment where that urine drips out into the collecting system of the kidney, there are, there are changes being made. Another picture of the nephron, just a little bit different, maybe a little bit clearer. There are four or five separate but very distinct portions of the nephron. There's a proximal convoluted tubule. There's this big yellow loop called the loop of Henle. There's a distal convoluted tubule, and then there's a collecting duct. Kidney stones can form in two main areas of this nephron. The first is in that, that bottom de dependent portion of the loop of Henle, where it makes that kind of 180 degree turn. Uh, you can get some calcium stones that form there and kind of erode through. And then in the collecting duct, you can have other crystals start to collect. And finally, just another blow up picture, just showing where all these transmembrane proteins are. It's a very active process, lots of things moving in and out. Lots of opportunities for people who are born with DNA a little bit off for those proteins not to work just like they should. Where are we going here? All right, so one example of this is um, people who are born with problems uh, reabsorbing an amino acid called cysteine. Cysteine is all over the place. Uh, if you break down any protein, you'll have cysteine as a byproduct of that. And some folks are born with one of those proteins, one of those transportation molecules that doesn't work in reabsorbing cysteine from the urine. So if you can't reabsorb cysteine out of your nephron back into your body from the urine, it will accumulate there and it will start to crystallize there. And once you start getting crystals of anything, those crystals love to stick together. And guess what happens next? Stone forms. That's how all stones form from crystals to larger stones. So this is someone who could have the perfect diet, the perfect everything else, but they can't help it. Uh, they form stones. I have a patient. He's 18 years old. He's had three or four of those big through the back surgeries I mentioned earlier. I first met him at UAB in residency, helped my attending do his first surgery, and just through the grace of God, met him again down here. So there's been wonderful continuity of care there, but I feel for him. He's a baseball player. He wants to, you know, like all guys, you know, uh, be good in sports and drink protein and work out and all that, but all that would cause him to have more stones. So he's been limited just because he was, um, one parent had one gene, another parent had the same gene. They came together and the luck of the draw, the unluck of the draw was that he got both of those recessive genes and that's why he has his condition. It's a recessive trait. So I circled the area in the nephron, that proximal convoluted tubule, that little blue circle, that's where the cysteine transporter molecule is, is defective for him. This is what a cysteine crystal looks like in the urine. It's a hexagonal crystal, and those crystals coalesce into larger stones, and they are darn hard, too. Can't use the shock wave on a cysteine stone. All right, what about uric acid transport? Um, uric acid, you know, it may ring a bell. Folks who have gout, that's a uric acid problem, a little bit different problem than this. Um, gout does lead to a higher risk of stones, but this issue with the transporter and the convoluted tubule Almost the same as cysteine, you can't absorb the, the uric acid well enough. The uric acid gets into the kidney or gets into the nephron, it can't get out. Um, pH changes take place, the tubes, the crystals come together to form stones. We call that renal hyperuricemia. And um, yeah, it's all about a, an anion transport protein defect in the proximal tubule. Here's a picture of urate or uric acid crystals up top in urine, they look different than cysteine, and how they coalesce into forming uric acid stones. Pretty jagged looking stones. Interestingly, this is one of two stones that can be dissolved chemically. I'll get more into this later. But if you deacidify the urine, if you increase the pH in urine up into the seven and a half, eight range, Uric acid likes to dissolve in basic urine. So if you've got a big uric acid stone or someone who's a known uric acid stone former, hydration, dietary, all that, but also making their urine less acidic can dissolve these things and maybe prevent, problem or prevent surgery in the future for them. The other type of stone that can be dissolved is an infection-based stone and simply by avoiding infection and using a different chemical. So, Distal, there's a condition called renal tubular acidosis. We refer to it as RTA. 
And this is why I love urology so much, by the way, because we're, we do a lot of surgery, but we also get to be nerdy a little bit and talk about biochemistry. And my, my nephrology friends are probably turning their noses up, but um, we, we get a little bit of both. Um, so RTA, there's a lot of different types of RTA, but this one is focused in the distal convoluted tubule. And uh, it is a problem where those transmembrane molecules that I keep talking about, another one of those is messed up. And the mess up is that it cannot excrete, it cannot get rid of hydrogen ions. That's basically acid. So when you, when you have this problem, your urine is going to look really basic. It's going to look um, the opposite of acid, even though your bloodstream has a lot of acid in it. And that's one of the primary functions of the kidney is to help regulate that so that acid doesn't build up in your body. It gets rid of it in the urine. But the urine looks basic. The blood looks acidic. You can't figure out why. Well, we figured it out because there's this protein that doesn't really work very well. And long story short, um, this, this leads to bone weakness. It leads to kidney stones because of the acidification. Um, and this chemical that we'll talk a lot more about called citrate, it gets eaten up in the body and, and you don't get enough citrate in the urine to prevent stones. So you have this kind of trinity of problems, the increase in the pH in the urine, um, you get the decrease in citrate in the urine, and the increase in calcium in the urine because the bones are being broken down, and you form stones that are called calcium phosphate stones. And these are a classic finding in, in these patients. A beautiful picture above of a calcium phosphate crystal, uh, and then how those crystals come, that's, a, that's like an electron microscopic picture of the crystal. And then those come together to form uh, uh, just a regular photograph of a calcium phosphate stone. Looks kind of like the uric acid stone, but it's a completely different. This is an x-ray. You can see this hazy sort of patchy appearance of white up above. Those are the kidneys with diffuse stony material in them. When you have RTA, when you have this imbalance that I'm talking about due to this transmembrane protein problem, the kidneys just kind of generally calcify. You, these aren't even stones we could treat. These are within the kidney. So that's a problem. And if you see that on an x-ray, I'm always thinking, RTA and, and we need to figure this out. Another condition which is genetic but it's not a transmembrane protein problem, you're probably happy to get, rid of, get out of that phase because I've been talking about it so much, but this is a problem where you get dilation of the internal ducts in the kidney, that collecting duct, the last portion of the nephron, that furthest most tube leading out, that will dilate up, get real big, much bigger than it should be, and this is a cross-section of the kidney. You can see it looks real spongy in there. There's this nice, smooth, pink surface to the kidney, and then it looks a little bit darker pink. It's real spongy, almost kind of a moth-eaten appearance to it. Uh, these folks have terrible problems with kidney stones because of, of this defect. Uh, it's probably inherited, uh, but we haven't really found the, the gene for it yet. Same kind of picture as the nephrocalcinosis in RTA can be found with sponge kidney folks. You see those big white blotches through there. That's all calcium. That's all just stuff in the kidney that I couldn't go up and get even if I wanted to. This is a good example of when some people can get a lot of pain but not have a blocked up look to their kidney. All right, switching gears out of all that genetic stuff. Whew, get out of here. All right, we live in the South. It's starting to get hot outside. Those of you who are with me, uh, before we got in the building, we were hanging out on that porch, and it was okay, but we all know the temperature's rising, and we know how it can get later in the year. So just because of where we live, we experience more hydration loss, more dehydration during the course of our day in the summertime, uh, and really all the time, than people in other parts of the country. Um, so when, you, when the climate is high, hot and dry, especially, we're not dry here, but dry, uh, you get dehydrated, and dehydration is the foundation of stone formation. I don't care what stone we're talking about. If you're dehydrated, you're more likely to have it. So climate really does matter. <coughs> Occupations with exposure to excessive heat are the same, uh, and other conditions that promote dehydration, like diabetes or taking certain medicines. All right, opening up the book on dietary risk factors. Everything can be right genetically in you. You might not have any of those mutations, any of those protein problems, or functional or structural kidney problems. Everything can be right, but you can still get stones and wrong, rocks in wrong places, all right? Um, poor hydration, like I said, causes crystals to form and they coalesce faster in that state. And I say all the time, the solution for stone pollution is dilution, all right? I say it so much my nurses roll their eyes, but it's true. 
I tell people that the cheapest, most effective, most abundant medicine you'll ever put in your body is H2O, water. Um, and we, we don't have a, a healthy respect for that. And a lot of us just have downright bad habits and we don't like to drink water because it's, it's bland or it's boring or whatever. I say, get over it. <laughs> drink your water. And we need to have our kids drinking more water too. Let's talk about some other dietary risk factors. After I take a sip of my tea, okay? I did dilute it half and half with water. I really did. All right, high salt intake. That's something else that we experience quite often here uh, in this part of the country. It's almost a cultural thing to kind of eat what we eat and, and enjoy what we enjoy there. Um, but, you know, fast food's all over. And Americans generally eat a lot more salt than they need. Uh, that's, a, that's a problem on many levels. Um, but in kidney stones, when you increase your dietary intake of salt, your urinary output of calcium is going up. There's a direct link. Salt in, calcium out. It's bad for your bones, it's bad for your blood pressure, it's bad for your stone risk. So that's a big one I talk to people about. And these are just general recommendations here. High animal protein intake. That's something else that's a big part of the American diet and the Southeastern diet. We like pork and, and beef and chicken and fish and really all of these types of animal protein uh, can increase, increase the acid load in urine, can acidify urine. It can take out that friend of ours called citrate and lead us down a couple of other different roads towards stone formation, especially with the uric acid types of stones uh, or people with gout. Low magnesium intake depletes magnesium levels. Magnesium is like citrate. It's our friend. It's a stone inhibitor. It's great. Uh, can't have too much of it, really. But unfortunately, a lot of foods with magnesium have a lot of some, another chemical called oxalate that's not good. And a lot of folks don't eat their green leafy vegetables like they should or, or other good sources of dietary magnesium. Processed foods, foods in boxes, don't have a lot of magnesium. All those foods in the kind of the central part of the grocery store, try to stay on the outer rim, try to stay on the periphery. All right. Excessive calcium supplements raise urine and calcium too high. This is a very pertinent question because osteoporosis is a real issue, osteopenia. A lot of folks, probably a lot of folks in this room are on calcium supplementation because they don't want to have bone breaks. I have a lot of prostate cancer patients I follow. I tell them to get on calcium uh, when they're on certain treatments. We don't want bone problems. But the body behaves differently when you take a calcium supplement as opposed to when you eat a natural food with calcium in it. We found in different studies and through our research that folks who take high levels of calcium through supplements, they have higher, higher risk of stone formation. Folks who eat an appropriate amount of calcium in, in a regular dietary form actually have a protective effect from that. So calcium is not a bad guy. That's, that might be one of the take home messages from this talk. I explain this all the time in clinic. Folks are like, doctor, I'm, you'd be proud of me. I'm not eating any calcium. I'm going, no, who told you that? You know, because calcium is important. It's like a sponge in your gut. I'm gonna switch the slide over to over this next one. Too little calcium in the diet can allow more of a chemical called oxalate to get into your bloodstream and into your kidneys. Calcium and oxalate, they like to get together. Uh, they sponge up each other. And if you can do that, if you can create that, that link between calcium and oxalate in the gut, it'll come out through the gut. But if there's not a much, as much calcium as there should be in the diet, the oxalate gets through the gut, into the bloodstream, into the kidney where there's a lot of natural calcium anyway. And that's where they'll link up into calcium oxalate crystals and form stones. So too, too little calcium is a bad thing for a lot of reasons. Try to get it in your diet. And I'll, I'll show you a better, more high yield slide on that later. Too much oxalate can enter the urine and combine with calcium there to form stones. Oxalate diets are tricky. Random foods have a lot of oxalate. I'll show you a picture in a minute. It's hard to memorize that. But we found that really more important than reducing your oxalate is having the appropriate calcium intake, sponging it up, keeping it in the gut. Um, more on that later here. Anybody here heard of the keto or the Atkins diet, low carb diets? Yeah, very effective in losing weight. Generally, pretty healthy diets, I think. People have beat their diabetes with it, lost a bunch of weight, helped their blood pressure. Always consult your primary doc or your nutritionist on that before you start it, not your urologist. I'm just a dumb plumber, but I've seen it do a lot of good, all right? What's bad about it is that it will acidify the bloodstream because you're trying to shift your metabolism more towards burning fat and protein, and you create ketone bodies, and those are acidic-type bodies. It'll eat up the citrate, create more acid in the, in the urine, 
and uh, certainly a lot of evidence. If you're a high-risk stone former, it might not be the diet for you. There's another diet called the DASH diet. It's uh, an anti-hypertension diet, DASH, and Google it. That's actually been shown to help out with kidney stones because it's just a good eat your fruits and vegetables, you know, moderation in all things kind of diet. Now, did you know that too much vitamin C can be bad? Vitamin C is touted as that, hey, you can't have enough vitamin C, it's great. You know, it's good for this, that, and the other. It'll, you put it on your tomatoes outside, it'll help them grow better, right? But not, not necessarily the case for a stone former. If you have over a gram of, cal of vitamin C in your diet per day, a lot of that will be turned into oxalate, which is what we just talked about. So be careful, mega doses in vitamin C are not always that great for high-risk stone formers. We're moving along. Here are some general recommendations. This is a nice little take-home slide, generally. Drink plenty of water. I get the, the question all the time, Doc, how much water should I drink? Give me a number, Doc, I'll hit it. I said, unfortunately, it's not that easy. You're gonna have to measure your urine, sorry, because we base it on how much urine you produce. You know, different parts of the country, different people. We want, you, we want everyone to be producing about two to two and a half liters of urine a day. It might take a lot of drinking here in Mobile, Alabama in July or August to create that because you're breathing off humidity, you're sweating, all that stuff. But if, if you can produce two and a half liters of urine per day, the tipping point, that was the name of that book earlier about Gladwell, the tipping point. The tipping point is at about 2.5 and, and your risk just goes way down. That's why I say the solution for pollution is dilution. Now, talk about our friend citrate again. If you add lemon juice to your water, you will have a wonderful natural source of citrate. Contrary to popular belief, lemon juice and citrate will not dissolve the most common calcium stones. They could dissolve those uric acid stones if you do a lot of it, but you'd have to be down in the lemon juice, buddy. It'd take a lot. It's better done with the pill, kind of like a, you know how you have cranberry pills to concentrate cranberry juice? We've got pills to kind of concentrate the citrate. But uh, it won't, won't dissolve the, the more common stones, it will dissolve the uric acid stones. Add it to your water, it's great. Um, the pill, potassium citrate, looks like a big horse pill, but you take it twice a day, it really gets you going. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Don't be afraid of calcium, like I just said. It's not your enemy, it's your friend. Try to find it in natural dietary sources. One gram a day for most women, about up to 1,200 milligrams or 1,500 for, for most men. Um, make sure your vitamin D is good too or else you can't absorb the calcium. But um, don't be afraid of the calcium. Low salt diet, which I discussed, decreases the calcium levels in general. And try to add magnesium. I recommend just a supplement um, if you're a, a high-risk stone former, if you've formed stones before. A lot of the foods with good magnesium are like spinach, um, other green leafy things like I mentioned, um, different whole grains, different foods that also have high oxalate levels. So you've got high magnesium and high oxalate. They'd probably kind of cancel out. So I've kind of broken down and just told my patients who need it, just get, get yourself a magnesium supplement for that. Uh, the pictures on here speak for themselves. Good citrus fruit, uh, lemonade, and holding off on the salt on your fries. So here we are back at oxalate again, because, you know, it's just a challenge, and everybody wants to know what not to eat, and that's the thing that comes up the most frequently. So beware of it. Know what has high oxalate levels. Here's a nice little graphic. You know, a lot of good foods are on here. Chocolate is on here. Swiss chard, rhubarb, beets, raspberries. I mean quality of life right here in front of your face. Good, good food. Um, and it's okay to eat these things. You want to drink water when you eat these types of foods? You want to eat something with calcium in them when you eat these kind of foods. That way you'll sponge it up, you'll flush it out, and you can enjoy these things, but you can't just eat rhubarb salad all day long uh, and expect not to have some trouble at some point. Um, probiotic, down at the bottom I put probiotic, question mark. This is an area of fascinating research right now. My alma mater up at University of Alabama at Birmingham, my, my residency, is doing research on a bacteria that um, lives naturally in our gut. It's called Oxalobacter formigenes. A lot of Oxalobacter is um, being threatened with all the antibiotics that we use right now for all these different reasons, and regular antibiotics can kill Oxalobacter. But what Oxalobacter does, it eats oxalate for breakfast. You got oxalate in your gut, the bacteria actually eats it, breaks it down, and the hypothesis now is that if we can fix and make sure people have oxalobacter in their gut like they should, maybe they won't form as many kidney stones. 
And there's been some really convincing data to that. You might see a, a kidney stone probiotic on the drugstore shelves in the near future. Um, and I would say there's data to support that. Now, how do you know if you really have an oxalate problem? Some people do, some people don't. Your liver can make it naturally. There's a lot of different sources. I'll get to that one in a minute. I know I'm putting a lot off for later, but I do have some good slides later. Here's a nice one I put in here for general prevention before we get specific. And I just liked it because it, sh it shows kind of what your plate should look like, you know. Plenty of fruits and vegetables, uh, two to three ounces of lean protein, some starches and grains. You drink lemonade. Uh, you, you have at least one serving of dairy or something with calcium in it. You know, almond milk, coconut milk, um, soy milk. There are more milks on the, in the dairy case now than you know what to do with. But all of them have a lot of calcium. I think those other non-dairy milks actually have more calcium uh, than regular milk. Um, I've been looking at it. So if, you, if you're lactose intolerant, you're not limited. Just find something that works. Have a little bit of that with each meal to soak up any oxalate. Now, let's get specific, okay? I know time's running thin, but I think we're doing okay. Let's get specific and, and move on. Uh, general recommendations are great, but best practice is to get specific if you've had two or more stones, or if I do an x-ray and see two or more stones. We want to get a 24-hour urine study. We want to break it down from a biochemical standpoint and say, instead of giving you this kind of broad net of recommendations, why don't we give you what you need specifically? So we look at all these things, we break it down. You see urine calcium, urine oxalate, urine citrate, supersaturation of phosphate, pH, uric acid. I mean, this is like doing a science project on your kidneys and your urine. And when we look and see, we can start putting the pieces of the puzzle together. This is an actual sample result report that I get in my office every day on people. This person has a little bit high on the urine calcium. That 305 is towards that red or orange range there. I would look at that and say, okay, Mr. Doe, how you doing with your salt intake? Are you putting extra salt on? Are you hydrating? Are you taking a calcium supplement? I can ask much more pointed questions. And if he answers all those questions correctly, well, by golly, maybe he's got one of those transmembrane protein problems. Maybe we need to try a medicine to help him with that. So we can get very nerdy on kidney stones very quickly if we just have some data. All right, here's the second part of that report. I love them because they we'll be getting these on people every six months and we can compare month to month to month and say, oh, you had a good one, you had a bad one, and it really helps us unlock uh, the secret to most people's kidney stone problems. I could spend a whole hour just talking about these reports. So beyond dietary modification, we have that pill called potassium citrate. It's like lemon juice in a pill, very potent. It's by prescription only. It's not a drug, it's just a supplement, but it's by prescription only. Helps with a lot of things. Um, Hydrochlorothiazide is a, is a diuretic, it's a blood pressure medicine. That's what we use to decrease urinary calcium in people who are doing everything else right, but they still have high calcium in the urine. Uh, allopurinol is one that can help reduce uric acid levels. Uh, if you have gout or have a loved one with gout, they may take allopurinol for that reason. Sometimes we'll use that in stone prevention. Sodium bicarbonate, baking soda. This is something that can deacidify urine. It'll help put more citrate into the urine. Uh, sometimes if, they can't, if folks can't tolerate the big pill of potassium citrate, we'll tell them to do a little sodium bicarbonate. Problem there is that there's sodium in it, there's a little salt in that, so we can't use too much of that or else it'll defeat the purpose and put too much calcium back into the urine. Thiola, uh, down at the bottom right, is the drug that my young 18-year-old friend with citrate or cysteine stones takes. He has to take five pills three times a day. It's, it's an amazing load, and it kind of makes him nauseous. There are side effects to it, but that's the only, one of the only ones that will decrease that cysteine in the urine and help him not form stones. All right, parathyroid disease, there are these little glands up here. If you have a certain look to your 24-hour urine, you might have a gland problem in your neck that's causing the stones in your kidneys. I can refer you to someone to take those out and cure your kidney stones if that's you, okay? That's the gist of that slide. Other general medical factors, obesity, diabetes, gout, Crohn's, or any other chronic intestinal inflammatory disease, urinary infections, overactive parathyroids. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons. It's complex. There are people, there are urologists out there who only do stones. My chairman at UAB, Dr. Dean Asimos, just smartest guy I've ever met probably, amazing doctor. That's all he does. You know, such a talent, it's all he does and people love him for it. All right, here's some, these are from, these are Dr. Asimos' slides I put on mine, so full credit to him, I'm not trying to plagiarize. Calcium oxalate stones, that's what some of them look like, very barbed. 68% of all stones are these calcium oxalate stones. 
We talked about uric acid stones. They're about 10%. Struvite is a term for infection stones. If you have a chronic infection in the kidney, that'll create stones as a byproduct of the infection. If you don't get rid of the infection, you can't get rid of the stone. But if you don't get rid of the stone, you can't get rid of the infection. So what we got to do for these folks is treat them with some strong antibiotics, get them to surgery, get their stone out, and then finally they could relax and, and enjoy life. Sometimes you lose the kidney here. Cysteine stones we talked about, very rare, only 1% to 3% of all kidney stones, very hard. Genetic condition can't be helped other than with medicine and very specific dietary uh, remedies. Uh, apple cider vinegar doesn't dissolve stones, sorry. Not that I know of. <laughs> There hasn't been any, I just put it on here because I came across that in my research. And it does a lot of other things apparently, but it doesn't dissolve stones. It doesn't even really even make sense why it, it should. It's very acidic. But um, yeah, so how are stones best treated? Prevention, like we've talked about. The biochemical workup with the urine studies like we talked about. Natural passage of a stone. We want to keep people comfortable. We want to give them a medicine called Flomax to help relieve pressure, relieve muscle tension. It does help. Flomax is very common. I'm sure a lot of guys have heard about Flomax. It is legit. It helps you pass small stones that are in your ureter. If you go to the ER and you have a stone and they don't give you Flomax, ask them for it or call me and I'll call you some in. All right. Uh, fluids, you might need some nausea treatment. Uh, if you have uric acid stones, try to dissolve them. And if you have an infection, definitely get it treated. So we can use those flexible scopes that I showed you earlier. We've already covered this. Flexible scopes, go up, get it, use a laser. Five to seven days later, you're feeling like a champ. Shock wave, we already talked about that. Um, one term I like to use to make myself feel like I'm smart is Steinstrasse. It's a, a German term. It means stone street or traffic jam of stones. You know, if you crush a stone in the, in the kidney and it comes down in all these pieces, sometimes those pieces do get hung up. And that's one of those times you might need a stent. So beware of the Steinstrasse. That's why we don't do huge stones like that. Um, and then my favorite, the one that made me want to become a urologist, is the percutaneous approach. And we are there. All right. So Waze has, has brought us through. And thank you very much for your attention. I know it went a little bit long, but y'all have been awesome. And I would love to open the floor up for, for any questions you may have. Yes, sir. Any way we can get uh, copies of these slides? Yeah. I'd, yeah, just send me a check for about $150, <laughs> and it'd be great. It'd be great. No, I think it's going to be posted. Um, yeah, <laughs> only, kind, only kind I do take, you know. My pockets are wet most days. Um, yeah, it's going to be posted on our website. So if you go to University of Urology's website, there'll be a link up to that pretty soon. That'll probably be the easiest way to get your hands on it. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the interest. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, you talked about uh, genetics. Can you uh, say what percentage of people, statistically speaking, of if they have no parents that have had stones, yeah. what is the likelihood of them getting stones? If you have one parent that has stones, if you have both parents that have stones like myself, yeah. Yeah. what's the likelihood of me getting stones? Great question. So you're, all I can really say, um, honestly, is that with both parents who are stone formers, you have a significantly increased risk of getting kidney stones. Something that, you know, at the first sign of any microscopic blood in your urine that might ever be seen, or the first twinge of pain in your flank, I would, I would go to your, your general practitioner and say, or the GP might be even telling you about the blood that he's seeing in your urine. I'd let him know about that history. And the easiest way to get screened for stones is just to get a plain one-shot x-ray. We call it a KUB. It's not even a CAT scan, but it'll pick up, you know, eight out of 10 stones. And um, yeah, significantly higher with both patients, with both parents. Um, yes? I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, that's okay. Well, what was your first part of the question? Something about overall risk, if you had zero parents with stones or? Yeah. Sure. yeah. So, you know, about nine, 10% of people will just get them uh, spontaneously. Um, and uh, yeah, that doesn't seem like that big of a percentage of people, but we've got a lot of people in this country and uh, stones hurt a lot. So we're very busy with stones, especially in people who are what I call de novo or no family history whatsoever. So it sounded like you were alluding to this, this next question before I asked it, yeah. but the before a person actually gets into the painful situation, they can be proactive about this, and they can have the shockwave treatment that you talked about, yes. and possibly not experience the significant pain if they can be proactive? Correct. 
the first episode is usually a painful episode because we don't just x-ray people to screen for stones. That's not a good use of x-ray. It's not responsible. Um, so most people kind of learn the hard way the first time. And for people that I have, even after one stone, if I'm treating them, if they've had to undergo surgery, if they can't pass the stone, or heck, even if they have passed the stone, my standard follow-up procedure is to have them come in every year with a urine study and a plain x-ray. Uh, not a CAT scan, just a one-shot film to make sure there's nothing new forming, or if we're following a stone, to make sure it's not growing. And so that's my best answer is once you have one, once you've kind of learned the hard way, or if you have a really strong family history, I guess, just follow up with your GP or your urologist and, and get, get a little x-ray every year or two to make sure nothing new is forming. And if we see something, like you said, we could shock it, crush it up. Sandy particles are a lot better than rocks. Metformin keeping a good mix. Metformin uh, treats diabetes pretty well, keeps blood sugars down. Um, that's a good thing. That helps with all the biochemistry. Uh, to my knowledge, there's not a direct link between metformin and the formation of kidney stones uh, either way. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if something at some point comes out saying there might be a link. It seems like everything's connected these days. But I have plenty of patients on that, and we're treating them, and I don't, I don't generally make any recommendations about metformin. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Anything else? Where is your office at? Thank you for asking. My office is uh, right at the corner of Dolphin Street and I-65. It's in that big, tall glass building that says Bank Corp South on the side of it. It's going to say USA Health pretty soon on the side of it, too, because we've got two floors in there. Uh, but, yeah, we're on the third floor of that building, and um, we've been open since November of 2018. As of last week, yes, we do. Uh, we have a new partner. His name is Chris Keel, Dr. Keel. He's a uh, very talented, very smart guy. He has a Thursday clinic at the Mitchell Cancer Institute building in Fairhope and all day clinic there, very, very busy. If you go see him, he's a great guy, but he sees about 30 or 35 patients a day. So he's in and out, because there's a lot, of, a lot of business and a lot of problems, and it's nothing personal if he doesn't hang out with you for 20 minutes, but yeah, he's good. Was there a question? Yes, sir. Uh, one of your first slides, you were talking about the doctor years ago operated on himself. Yes. In his bladder. It looked like he had a stone about the size of a chicken egg. Is that true? Yes, yes. it is. So, you know, we started, the history started with bladder stones, and then I, I really got into more focusing on kidney stones. Bladder stones are, are a bit of a different animal. They, get, they can get very large. They can get as big as a softball. Um, but it's caused not by a kidney problem. It's caused by a prostate problem. When the bladder doesn't empty all the way and there's stagnant urine chronically, those crystals form in the bladder primarily and get to be a big stone. And it can be very painful and cause infections in blood. And uh, it was quite the ailment back in the day, which is why some people actually got desperate enough to let people do that surgery on. Yeah. Dr. Didut. <laughs> uh, well, great. Well, thank you again for coming. I really, really enjoyed talking. Um, the opportunity is an honor, and I hope to see you soon. Okay.